to be honest, before we went into Ronald McDonald House, we'd heard about it, like we'd seen it on the news and we'd seen fundraisers. We didn't really get it. Even though we are from the country, all our clients are from the country, all a lot of our friends are from the country, we had no idea. So what we're trying to do here is go, this is amazing, they need as much money as you can get. I was here um, at home um, while the boys were doing the P&G trek and I so clearly remember where I was when, when the call came through. Dave had been reaching out to, to us and, and eventually got Crawford and, and Crawford came to me and said, you need to call Dad quickly because there's something wrong and um, yeah, Fergus is not well. When we're in P&G and you first learn about your diagnosis, what did you first think? I wasn't scared about it, I just googled it. I was just curious. Well, Ferg and I were in Papua New Guinea hiking the Kokoda Track, so it was in day one. And as we're going down this very steep hill, he started getting wobbly legs and then started getting blurred vision and double vision. And after the first day, we turned around and came back. And that day in the hospital, they just thought he'd got a tropical disease or extreme dehydration, which is quite common. And then we uh, went back the next um, day and asked for a scan to make sure we could fly him home, actually, which is why we got him scanned. And there they found a five centimetre mass in his cerebellum. Once we got um, Fergus to Perth, he had an MRI and they diagnosed him preliminary with what they thought which eventually became true, which is a medulloblastoma. And three days later, he was in surgery. So they removed the tumour in a, uh, I think about eight or nine hour surgery. It was so painful. It just pressed down on the bumps. So difficult. They put this over your face. It fits perfectly. It's really painful though. And that caused a whole lot of complications because it was in his cerebellum. He got this thing called cerebellum mutism. So he lost his ability to talk. He lost his ability to walk. He lost all the use of his right side. He had the surgery and he had four weeks to recover. Then he instantly started the radiotherapy. But in that first four weeks, we were also trying to start rehabilitation. It was pretty terrifying because you had this very fit child who was, you know, doing all the normal things to all of a sudden he, like nothing. And at that stage, he, you know, when he went to Kokoda, he was 64 kilos. By the time he got through that first month, he went right down to 51 kilos. So he was tiny, there was nothing left of him. We would just started the second month of a four month chemotherapy or four rounds of chemotherapy. The last round of chemo is mid November. So once you finish the treatment in December, what are you most looking forward to? Walking again. Yeah. And walking the Kogoda. We have just had the most amazing network of, you know, friends and family who have actually been so supportive. One of my dear friends started a thing called Meal Train because everyone kept reaching out saying, how can we help? And so what she did is she actually coordinated everyone. And for the three and a half months that we lived in hospital, we had a hot meal delivered every single night to our front door. So we never, ever had to worry about cooking. Pretty much one of us is with Ferg 24 seven. Um, he's never left on his own, but we obviously have Agrimath to run as well. So we tag team in the office um, so one of us is always with the teams. On the fifth floor at PCH, if you have a child in ICU who is critical, they basically, at their discretion, get to decide whether you can actually stay in there for one night, two nights, whatever it takes while your child is still quite critically ill. Um, so it's predominantly saved for obviously country people, but then they also let anyone who's not necessarily country, stay in there. And the first three nights that Ferg had had his surgery, he was very, very sick. So we were permitted to stay there. Um, and so grateful because obviously, if anything happened within five minutes, you could have been by his side. So what Ronald McDonald House do is, don't worry, 
here's some accommodation. You just sleep there, we'll feed you, we'll look after you. You just worry about your child. They make the process a lot easier. They're a lot less painful. You couldn't have a better charity than Ronald McDonald House. It 100% goes to the core of looking after country people. What we are planning to do is obviously have a fundraiser. Um, we would like to adopt a room for two years, which is 22,000. So what we're looking for is for all of our customers to obviously donate and we can try and get one as soon as possible. It's our people, it's our clients, and we just decided that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna try and work with our clients to raise and pay for one of these rooms. We're in the thick of it right now. We see it every day, and we see how much good that they do. It would be so awesome if we could um, definitely get one for two years. Mm. And if we can raise more than that, well yeah. then that's phenomenal. You think with the uh, thousands of clients and farmers across um, Western Australia, it's a small amount from every, every family, but that small amount adds up to that $22,000 plus as much as we can support for those, that room. Um, but, you know, it makes a massive difference to whatever families end up in there. On any given day, you can just be cruising along nicely and then disaster strikes. And you just never ever know when you're going to need it. And so, it is just such a worthy cause. It's just easier to go through this stuff with the support, with more support.